Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's uh, very special that you join us and um, uh, have, have done so quite often for these Humanizing Growth series uh, that we're running as the Institute for Real Growth. A little bit more about that later. But before I go into any detail, uh, I'm going to just uh, say a very warm welcome and especially a big thanks because it's three hours earlier there. So it's really early morning there to uh, my friend and co-collaborator in the past, uh, Jim Stengel. Welcome, Jim. Where are you and how are you? Good morning, Mark. You look bright and happy this morning in your <laughs> studio with your drums and guitar and everything else. Yeah. So I am. It is very early. So I'm, I'm enjoying my Nespresso coffee. Me too. My master marketer mug. Uh, it's good. my aspiration, right? I, I did not buy this for myself. It was a gift. <laughs> uh, I'm in Coronado, California, which is just outside San Diego. And uh, I'm quarantining here, if you will, working from here. Uh, we'll be out here for the summer. And uh, my wife and I have, uh, my wife's a San Diego native. So when we were working in Germany with P&G, her mother died suddenly and we quickly bought a house in San Diego and uh, have been in that house, recently sold it. And we're now working on a restoration of a Dutch colonial revival house. And uh, we kind of like, we like fixing up homes. So we're in the last stages of that. So if you see any wires in the background or if the lights start blinking, that's yeah. kind of the life we live. But I'm doing very well, thank you. I hope everyone on the panel is doing well. Thanks for, I see some friends joining. Thanks for being with us. I'm looking forward to reconnecting with you, Mark, and everyone else. Well, it's fantastic that you uh, make the time for this. I know how busy you are. So, um, Jim doesn't need an awful lot of introduction, but uh, of course, I am going to give him one. Um, uh, starting uh, with the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to intertwine personal and uh, professional. Uh, you mentioned the studio that I'm sitting in. It's, uh, it's, it's had a few face uh, changes uh, since those days, but about 15 years ago, I was sitting here uh, working uh, again uh, over the distance with my uh, co-collaborator Frank van den Dries on uh, the final touches of our book, The Global Brand CEO. And um, I read an email or I saw a newsletter that you were retiring from Procter & Gamble. You'd been the uh, uh, head of marketing basically for over seven years there and, uh, and a very long career before that. Um, we knew of each other. I, I knew of you at least. I, maybe you didn't know of me, and which is why it was so special that uh, you responded to my uh, outreach email to, um, to ask if you were open to a discussion around how to run global brands and how to build a mar global marketing organization. And you were not only very generous with your time, uh, you uh, right from the moment, and, uh, and that's very, um, uh, very distinguishing, right from the moment, you opened yourself up and talked about those things that had gone very well, but also those things that you had found difficult because you wanted others not to have to fall into the same pitfalls. And that's a quality that uh, we see very rarely in leaders that rise to the top of their industry. At some point, somehow, we all uh, seem to think that we uh, need to know it all. And you are the opposite. Uh, you've always been a learning person. Growth mindset as a definition that I think you helped shape. And uh, so as Jim moved out of Procter & Gamble and into uh, something I tease him with sometimes, the Jim Stengel company, but it does say what it is, <laughs> a company that Jim has built with um, lots of collaborators that are all, I think, disciples in the sense that they are people that have just loved working with you in Procter & Gamble and wanted to continue to work with you. Another testimony, not just to your craft, but also to your personality and leadership style. And, um, and you've gone on to actually focus on what is your passion and has also always been our passion, brand purpose and how brands can play, uh, brands and marketing can play a, a bigger role in life. Um, Jim, you've been incredibly successful. You're at the top of the industry. You're now a teacher, uh, not just at universities, but also uh, you work with the ANA on their CMO program. You, um, uh, I know, advise and consult many organizations. In Cannes, you play a big role, helping not just CMOs, but also aspiring CMOs. So we're very much in the same field. And I always say to you, it takes a village. And the fact that you're here means you agree. Um, th that's, that sounds purposeful, not just for brands, but for you. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got to that calling and um, you know, what got you where you are now. 
Well, it's a heavy question to start with, Mark. It's six in the morning out here. Yeah. <laughs> Take a sip of coffee. I don't, I, you know, I am just, I'm just filled with gratitude to so many people who have helped me over the years uh, become a better person, a better human being, and I guess a better marketer and business person. So, um, and I, I wouldn't be who I am without the people that uh, have loved me and have helped me and have been part of my life. Uh, you're in that wide circle. And, uh, and I think, and, you know, I know we're probably going to talk about what's going on in society and diversity later, but, you know, I, I can't imagine not being part of a diverse organization, a diverse world. Once you feel it, you cannot go back. Uh, so to me, not building a diverse organization is an enormous puzzlement because there's just, there's just no other way. So I just have great gratitude, Mark, to people who have shown me the way, who have inspired me over the years, teachers, parents, friends, uh, you know, family. And, and so it's hard to say where it started. I mean, I think I've, um, I've always been someone who um, tries to uh, exercise compassion, empathy, uh, a learning mindset, a growth mindset. And I think that goes back to my childhood, some of the first experiences I had. Um, and certainly Procter & Gamble was formative in that. You know, I, I, it was a company I thought I would join for two, three years, get my brand manager stripe and leave Cincinnati, Ohio and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just kind of fell for the mission of the company, the values of the company, the people of the company and what they were trying to do in the world. So, um, so I think, you know, it was implicit, I guess, throughout most of my life, but I think now it's more explicit. You know, I'm, I'm here really. My purpose is to help leaders, you know, be more happy more productive, more successful, more fulfilled by finding their organization's purpose, their personal purpose, and bringing it to life and finding a way to make it sustainable. So it's as simple as that. So, you know, we're kind of in the fulfilling leader business yeah. and I find purpose is the way to do that most effectively. I listened uh, to Paul Pullman yesterday before we did our session. I know Paul was one of your former guests and, uh, and he's one of the people who I'm, 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 I have, I'm very, very thankful for that I work with him. I knew him when he was younger. I knew when, when he was forming his ideas. And he is just an incredibly fabulous light in our world. He did an incredible job at Lever. And he's going to do even more in his post-Lever life. Yeah. So it was a great interview for everyone on the, uh, with us today. I would tune in and listen to Paul and Mark. It's a great dialogue. Well, that was a special conversation. Uh, you're right. Uh, let me pick up on some of the pieces. Uh, it's so funny, as you talked, uh, you mentioned gratitude, and I immediately think that in our family, that's always been a very important word. I know it's on my birth announcement, um, which happens to be uh, in another house here. Um, my mother framed it, and my wife found it uh, between some memorabilia, and that word is very special. Um, but the gratitude to people, it's funny that literally yesterday, I got a call from our first board member. He was a Unilever board member. And um, um, Frank and I uh, asked him to be a board member of our first consultancy. And um, he, um, he came up with some ideas. Now the man is now really in his eighties. And he asked me again about something that we just hadn't done. He actually asked about the Pullman interview and he said, do you have a written format? Have you written it out? And I said, no, I mean, we've actually been sending out links to the interview and we're thinking about recording it as a podcast or at least transforming it to a podcast, which is easy, of course, but we don't have it written out yet. This man has consistently over the last 25 years given me ideas that no one else has suggested. And he's still at it. And, and I'm sure you could name 10 of people like that in your life, right? Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, and, and they still keep coming. I mean... Dean Aragon's on our call, you know, the, yes. uh, and he, I, he was on my podcast about a year ago. Again, a bright light in our world. I've learned from Dean. I'm inspired by Dean on many levels, as a dad, as a husband, as a business person. Yes. So uh, there's just so much inspiration out there. We can never stop. We're, we're all evolving as leaders, as people. So I, I think it's, it's so very important. Well, I, I want to take the conversation two places, yeah. but I'm going to go... Um, 
um, asynchronous because um, I want to start talking about where you actually, I, I know you've told me in the past about how purpose became so clear uh, when you were leading one of Proctor's most important brands and uh, a session at, I think it was a Cologne d'Or uh, in, in near Cannes. We'll Good get memory. to that. But, uh, but I actually want to do big picture first because you mentioned you're there for, um, for this, yeah, what is a very, very difficult time. We thought we were coming out of it and in the US at least, it feels like we're just falling into it head, head first again. Um, uh, this pandemic and then um, the, the, the subsequent uh, inequality uh, struggle that's come to the surface uh, so, so loud and clear. Um, but t talk to me, if, if you look at the last three months with the perspective you have, what are the two or three things that are really big noticeables to you? What, what are your takeouts? For my, well, personally, I think for all of us, I think it's reinforced that family, friends, and health are number one. Hmm. And everyone I talk to about what they've learned over the last three months, it's a, I don't know, it's not a, it's a re, I hate to use the word rediscovery, but just this feeling that I've spent more time with my family, my loved ones, uh, and myself, and, um, and I've stayed healthy, I've been careful. And there's so many people who feel, there's one CMO of a large retailer who said to me, my mind is clearer. My hmm. mind is more at peace. Huh. So there's a lot of sadness in our world, a lot of people who are sick. We have record cases again in the US of COVID. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of sadness around us, but there are a lot of people who are also, I think, renewing what is most important in their life and their focus in their life. And I think that is really healthy. I mean, for myself, um, everyone talks about how the last three months have accelerated us 10 years, yeah. you know, e-commerce and habits and so on and so forth. And I think that's largely true. I think it's certainly true for myself, you know, where I was trying to take my life the last three months has accelerated that massively. So I've, I'm spending my time from the business sense on trying to scale some of the things we're talking about today. How do, I, how do we get the message and the passion and the interest for a different way of doing business, have even more people think about that? Yeah. So I'm spending more time on podcasts, on writing, on, on, on scaled training, which to me is very personally fulfilling. I learn in doing that and I think it's helping people become better leaders. And so I'm doing more of that and, and I'm doing more focus on, I think, the big gap in purpose and that is measuring it and yeah. linking purpose activation to business metrics. We still don't have that. That's why there are still cynics and skeptics on the yeah. purpose journey because there's two you worlds. Know, yeah. And I think, you know, purpose to me is in three steps. You have to find it or rediscover it. You have to activate it or bring it to life, as Paul Pullman talked about. Then you have to measure it and link it to your business metrics. We've done okay on the first two. We haven't done much on the last one. Yeah. And that make, makes it very vulnerable to personalities okay. and to leaders and to succession. So Unilever did a good job of bringing that Allen after Paul, but that could have gone south, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so I think we have a massive opportunity in purpose measurement. I've, I'm, I'm investing in that. Uh, my team is investing in that. We're working with a startup who we think has a really, really good platform. And, and I think if we can crack the purpose measurement opportunity, to me, that's my legacy. Well, two questions, just quick follow-ups. Well, by the way, what is a startup? Is it already uh, trading? And what, what's it called if people are interested? There are uh, a few investors in it. It's a five-year-old company called Bera, B-E-R-A, uh, oh, yes. started by an XWPP person, by the way, yes. Mark. Yes, I remember you talking about it at the ANA. His name is Ryan Barker. He's the founder. And uh, they have a fabulous list of clients right now. They're seeing real, real results. And uh, we... My team had an offsite about two years ago and we, re we reviewed what we've done well and not well over the last 10 years. What's inspired us? What are the, what are the clients that we've had the most you know, fun with and impact yes. with? Yes. And, um, and then we said, what's our next five or 10 years look like? And, and this is where we said, we've got to crack purpose measurements. So we started a, um, 
an investigation, who was doing what around the world. So we talked to all the usual players. We talked to a lot of CMOs. And, uh, and Vineet Mera at Walgreens Boots, the global yeah. CMO of Walgreens Boots, he said, you guys got to go talk to Barra. So Vineet introduced us and we went to see what they were doing and we said, whoa. So we began uh, several, we, we began working with them for about a year to pilot purpose measurement. Yes. And we liked what we were getting. And so we, inv- we decided to invest in them and a, a venture capital firm came in with us. And so they're well-funded right now. Uh, they're hiring, they're refining their methodology. So, I mean, I'm not, I sound like I'm pitching. I believe in the company. I'm no, I in- asked you because I think many people, um, I know that uh, many people are chasing this. And if you, if you think that these, com- th- these guys are doing the right things, uh, you know, I, as I was listening to you, um, who has talked to a lot about this, but not specific to the purpose aspect, um, is um, a, a, a joint friend that maybe you didn't know he was really uh, working so much on this, uh, Chris Burgrave, the former CEO oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. of, of uh, AB InBev. Yeah. Uh, so he, so he, he's a business person, and I actually spoke to him very recently because he's now going to um, do a PhD on this topic. Um, his biggest pet peeve is that when investors look at companies and they see that a company spends a lot on marketing, marketing and advertising, uh, they take that to be a good thing. And he's been in discussions where he was like with the CEO of the company in a global shareholder meeting. And people were saying, well, why aren't you spending as much as X? Now, being a 3G company, I think that is a question that's warranted. Certainly when we've seen what Kraft Heinz uh, had to suffer through because of lack of spending. But still, uh, his point is, a lot of th- their metric seems to be, if you spend a lot on it, it must be good. Whereas you could be yeah. really foolish in your spend. And so he's yeah. working a lot on, on actually bringing rigor to that and helping them uh, understand the, the levers and the efficiency and the effectiveness of that spend. I think you guys should re, uh, re-engage because he's no, very Chris, passionate you, about this. Chris, as you know, is ex-P&G. Yes. Uh, I, I knew him X-Pro. when I worked in Europe with P&G. He, he went on to AB InBev and other things. Uh, yeah. He has a book that he wrote a few years ago. I think it's called right. Marketing is Business is Finance. It's something exactly. like that. And uh, yeah, he's been on this. When he was at AB and Dev, we talked about this. So, yeah. okay, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and it was time to move it into action. And Chris is certainly an advocate on that journey. Yeah, he is. We, um, it's maybe fun to tell people because it's one of those things. Remember, there's a lot of CMOs listening here who I always try and get out of this conversation, things that people could apply today. And one of the things, and, and, and that's where Chris comes in again, that we've done a few times now, is a challenger board. Uh, we actually mm. mentioned it in the IRG program. We, we talk about uh, opening up the growth ecosystem, uh, first opening up internally, being much better connected between senior and junior, but also between marketing and sales and the rest of the organization. And then it becomes very fluid how you work with the startups that you're perhaps creating a, a place to uh, incubate for, the companies that you've just bought, think of Sir Kensington and, and, and all the other companies that Unilever have bought and not actually smothered to death, but leveraged uh, to bring in as diverse thinkers to help change the mothership. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about doing to bring the outside world in is a challenger board. And, uh, and, and you and Sylvia Lagnado and the former CMO of Unilever, Chris uh, Simon Clift, and, uh, and, and, and a few others, including Chris, were the challenger board for Diego Scotti at Verizon. And he's talked about that at the a a Masters as having been the sort of wake up and support uh, mechanism in the past. How was it for you to be part of such, something like that? I loved it, Mark. And I've, I've uh, searched and reapplied that idea with many, many other people. It's a wonderful idea. And for everyone listening, think of it. In fact, when my company did this offsite two years ago, we yeah. brought in a challenger board at the end of the offsite. We brought in about 10 people from various fields to poke at us, to push us. And one person said to us, you know, Stengel Company, you've been a good vitamin. You have to be a painkiller. Hmm. You have to tackle something even more important than you've been tackling. And that led us to the purpose measurement space. So that came out of the challenger board session. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I have a client right now I'm working with, a CMO, and we are, we are putting together a challenger board for that person. Ah, and I so uh, it's a wonderful idea, Mark. Thank you for that. 
Well, no, I mean, it, 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 what's so fun about it, uh, we, we, we developed this concept first when Dove, uh, and I want to go back to your Procter & Gamble days, and, and these, these actually run a little bit parallel, I know, because Dove, you've told me, was inspiration, even though it was in the other, in the other organization, those whose, whose name shall not be mentioned. <laughs> But still, um, so, so the, the story, uh, Silvia Lagnado is joining me next week for a conversation. So I actually would like to tell the story. Silvia Lagnado, great marketer, an engineer by training, incredible, um, sensitive marketer, sensitive to what's happening in the outside world, sensitive to true insights. And she developed with a core team this concept of real beauty, debunking the myth of real beauty and the fact that so many companies out there, remember today this is normal, but this is 20 years ago, that th these brands were basically telling you that you were not okay and you needed their products to become okay. And Dove went the other way. And, um, and we worked very um, closely with her to, to explain that within the Unity organization, which didn't know what they were doing. And then in the outside world, and um, uh, what, what she needed a challenger board because they went, they went to beauty Dove wasn't a beauty brand. They went to um, women empowerment and they knew nothing about that. They went to um, um, services and they knew nothing about that. And so we created a, a challenger board that had representatives from all of those areas. And every six months for 24 hours, literally starting with dinner and ending just before dinner the day after, these people uh, were co-collaborators coming in with lots of ideas because they pent them up in six months and, uh, and at the same time trying to understand where the strategy wanted to go and then helping them think through how. Uh, so indeed, it's a mechanism that has worked well. But I'd like to use it as a bridge to go to your story because I, it's at least where I know your purpose story to start. Uh, take us to that brainstorm with your agencies mm -hmm. In the gardens of La Colombe d'Or, which, by the way, guys, is in Vance, about half an hour from Cannes. I had my honeymoon there. So, again, we share some things in our past. And, um, and you were talking about, I think, Pampers. Pick, can you pick up the story there? Yeah, I think it even started earlier, Mark. Honestly, my first brand manager job was a brand that Smuckers owns now. It's called Jeff Peanut Butter, very ah. kind of American and uh, product. But I, that was my first brand manager job. And... We were stuck in a share battle with uh, Skippy and Peter Pan and private label. It was, it was hard to move market share at all. And we had a better product. So, of course, our P&G advertising was, you know, we had more fresh roasted peanut taste than any other brand. So demos, you know, choose your moms, choose Jif. I mean, a famous campaign. But we were, you know... Our, my team got together, and by the way, it was an incredibly diverse team for the 1980s. Uh, my brand group had an African-American woman. It had a engineer came out of the factory, Korean-American woman, a woman I brought in from sales, and a guy I brought in from finance. So really, really, really powerful team. And we said, how can we make a bigger impact? Mm -hmm. So what did we do? We did your challenger board. We went out and talked to mothers. We went out parent-teacher associations, farmers. We went out and talked to magazine editors who did content for young mothers. Say, so what could we do? And, and, you know, we found we had to play a bigger role in the, in the person's life. So we had to al align with the values of the consumers we served. So we started efforts to invest in things that moms cared about that made sense for our brand. So we had the largest ever donation program to parent-teacher associations that were aligned with our sales. So the more we sold in a zip code, the more money we gave to the local PTA. And we mm -hmm. talked about that. We talked about how we cared about what went into our product. We talked about the farmers that we worked with. And all of a sudden, market share started to go, to go up. Mm -hmm. And we started to differentiate not just on product, but on values. And, and, and the, the key metric is, does that brand care about what I care about? Yeah. So, so that was kind of the beginning. I wasn't as articulate about it as I am now, right. but I thought, let's do the right thing. Let's try to make a bigger impact with the consumers we serve. Yeah. So fast forward to Pampers. I was, just, I was just moved from Eastern Europe where I was running two countries to take the category job for Pampers. So I, I had EMEA, 
responsibility for Pampers as a business unit. And I was, um, actually, this is kind of interesting. Mathilde Delhomme, who's now the global CMO of LVMH, was the person who said to me, he was working on Pampers at the time, you have to come to an offsite with Saatchi and Saatchi. We are trying to kind of find our way as a brand. <laughs> so we did this offsite in Southern France. Barbara Boyle was the head creative on, the, on, the, on Pampers at Saatchi and Saatchi. Kevin Roberts, remember him? Yeah. Was the new CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi. He appeared there and he basically said, I'm all behind whatever you're trying to do and I will bring all the resources of Saatchi and Saatchi to this brand. And we sort of began the journey there to find our purpose, to make a bigger difference in the lives of mothers. And, and the brand at that point, from a brand equity perspective, was, was terrible. I mean, we, were, we had no empathy, no compassion. I mean, we were, uh, A.G. Laffley, our CEO, liked to say that the factory was the boss, not the consumer. Mm. You know, we were not an empathetic, caring, purposeful brand. And, and, and uh, people like Barbara Boyle, Mathilde Delhoum, uh, some people in R&D, some people in Consumer Insights, uh, CMK, P&G calls it, were passionate about making a bigger difference. With a simple insight, we are the brand that is at the moment of birth more than any brand in the world. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? You know, we were sampling our brand in hospitals. We were, we were the largest diaper brand in the world. We were, you know, we had an enormous direct mail program. So we were, we were touching the lives of mothers, but doing nothing with it. So, so that led us to the purpose that Pampers is still activating, whatever it is, 20 plus years later. And we ended, within 10 years, we tripled our size and became much more profitable and much more important in the lives of mothers and with a much more engaged organization. It was on the lower end of PNG's organizations in terms of engagement, it, it rose to the top. And, uh, and it's still a very, uh, very powerful story. And, and that's where I, in fact, Mark, I think that is why I was named CMO of PNG. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, and that's interesting. If I, it, it, because, you know, so many people, um, especially the people f following the, uh, the Institute for Real Growth program, and, and, and I'll just give like the 10 second commercial here, because um, not everybody listening may know what that is. And uh, we have just opened up the registration process for the 2021 uh, class or cohort, if you like. Uh, so last week, we had um, um, almost 100 CMO and other growth leaders uh, graduate from a uh, six month program that really goes through the, the why, the what, and the how of what we call real growth, that's to tease out, the, as opposed to fake growth, which is short-term and disingenuous, and this is really multi-stakeholder growth that creates value, not just for the shareholders, but actually starts with creating value for your customer, your colleagues, the community around you, and as a result, over-delivers results to, uh, to your shareholders. And, um, this program uh, it really connects leaders that are trying to make this work, that are trying to understand. And one of the key themes that we come across all the time is, well, we got it right somewhere, like let's say the Pampers brand. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but there's much more, and there's many more parts of the organization that we haven't touched. Um, can, can you talk a little bit, and the great thing is you had the global purview when you moved to the chief brand officer role. Um, so an organization sees something work. And, and, and I want to give a little bit more context because I believe it's true for 90% of companies. Uh, it was probably started by founders that had real vision and purpose. No one seems to start a company to make a lot of money, at least not in the old days. And, um, and then over time, the bean counters took over, the market became more um, vested and louder and represented, perhaps solely represented in the board of directors. And it suddenly seems to be about making more money every quarter rather than connected to that old corporate purpose. And so now you get it right on a brand and uh, you've got maybe one of the 50 big brands or maybe $25 billion brands uh, within Procter & Gamble. How do you convince an organization that this is actually a framework 
for the whole organization? How do you convince an organization uh, to walk away from some of those um, other belief systems that have come in that are only about making money and perhaps only about short term? Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic and that roadmap? Well, Mark, it, the great organizations of the world have always been consumer centric. They've always tried to be best at delighting someone, you know, and, and, and they, they spend time, energy, money, make, you know, making customers' lives better, happier, more fulfilling. And if you don't do that as a business, it's not going to end well. And that is such an evergreen area. It is such an evergreen space. You can never be done because it's so dynamic. Look at what we're living through now. Look at all of the behaviors, habits, practices that are shifting. If you're not in touch with that, then it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up badly. So, so to me, it's about one of the major jobs of a leader is to be always, always inquisitive, pushing, setting the new standard for people about being close to your customers, beginning meetings with that. You know, one, one ritual Laffley started when he became CEO for our leadership team is before every meeting we had of our global leaders at P&G, we did some immersion with customers, consumers that we didn't know much about. Yeah. And then we had our meeting. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's an enormous role modeling of the behavior. So I think you, you, uh, you can never, never stop being, being customer centric. And then when you are, you know, the reason purpose is, is scaling around the world is because it works, you know, and we have to, as again, we have to build into measurements, but the reason it became, it shifted the way Procter and Gamble built brands, the way Unilever builds brands is because it inspires organizations. It accelerates interesting innovation. It, it is customer centric at its heart and it results in better marketing, better brands, better behaviors. And then, and my job as CMO at PNG, every job, every multi-brand CMO's job is how do you codify that? How do you teach that? How, do, how does it evolve your framework for building brands? And those of you listening here, if, if your company does not have a way that you've kind of codified, refined, and continue to refine about how you grow brands, work on that. Because that's how you scale learning. That's how you scale what happens on Pampers into how a company can evolve and become better at what they do. So let me take that to a place that I know that you're very comfortable. Uh, I've had less exposure to, but now through the IRG program, a lot of participants also have come up with this um, eh, struggle. So you come from Procter & Gamble. I come from Unilever consumer centricity, immersion, it's, it, you know, you, you get it from birth at the company, uh, spoon fed, I was, is the term I was looking for. Um, a lot of the senior marketers are actually CMOs of technology companies. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you're on the West Coast now and not, not uh, I think, by coincidence, you've had a lot of um, engagements past your uh, P&G days with technology firms that, um, that, that, that believe in this but just weren't created that way or, or certainly aren't uh, structured that way now. And perhaps it was uh, the, the factory in charge at Pampers at the time. Um, there's a lot of companies where product management, and I don't mean marketers, I mean technology people are in charge. So can you talk a little bit about the dynamic that you've seen with marketers struggling to bring across this thinking in companies like that? Well, I, I, think, I think, Mark, it's, it certainly starts with the customer or consumer again. And I think CMOs that have been effective at technology companies represent the customer, the consumer. They know them well. They know their needs, their desires, their frustrations, and they coalesce the organization around that. Why is Microsoft doing so well these days? Yeah. yeah. You know, Satya is in many ways, their CMO, yeah. right? He brought in a different kind of passion about the customer, about partnerships, about culture, and a, a, an already very strong company became way better. And, and it sounds like a very simple, fundamental 
lesson, but it's, it's the, you know, uh, one of the people I admire is Ann Lunas at Adobe, who's yes, one of the too. longest standing CMOs. Yes. You know, you spend some time with her and she is respected in that company, strong relationships across functions with the CFO, with the CEO, and is very, very, very close to the product people and where the customer is moving, how the customer is shifting, how can they make a, you know, bigger difference in the lives of their customers. So, so the ones who are standing out, I think, in technology are the ones that are most successful and who bring this mindset. But it's, it's not a mindset of arrogance. It's a mindset of collaboration, cooperation, innovation, inspiration around making the lives of the people they serve better. It's yeah, as simple it's, as that. Yeah, it's a, so that's, a, it's, that's the asset test question. And, and, and for people considering the move to a CMO role in an organization that perhaps hasn't had one or where marketing has been the brochure where com department rather than the marketing department, I guess the asset test question is, do I believe that my colleagues are willing to go on the journey of consumer or customer centricity? Um, you mentioned two people. So Microsoft is actually the case study that we use across the whole Institute for Real Growth ecosystem um, um, uh, section, the, the, the how, when we look at the teams, the culture, the growth mm -hmm. mindset, the agility. But um, Anne is an example of somebody that we apparently both very much admire in how she... She managed to reframe the market for Adobe from something which was technology, um, CD-ROM based uh, software for creative people. That's, you know, you didn't work with Adobe unless you were, um, I guess I'm wearing the right shirt at the moment, uh, but I'm missing the Brooklyn Baird. Um, <laughs> you know, that's who worked with Adobe. And now, 10 years later, Adobe is the go-to place for all, you know, uh, CRM marketing strategic um, facilities, including all the, what did they buy? They bought two big companies, reframed their offer to marketers rather than to creatives. And, um, and, and I think that's a, a great example of what we call abundant market thinking. Um, you know, another uh, thing I just wanted to um, reflect on is this storytelling. So we, we've, we've created with Spencer Stewart, I think you contributed uh, again, very substantially to it also, the Da Vinci CMO profile, mm -hmm. which really brings together right brain, left brain, and empathy. Uh, you know, everybody knows that right brain and left brain are important. I think what we share a passion for is that, yes, that's true, but actually Da Vinci was a humanist and, and it takes that empathy. So it's all three, it's a magical triangle there. And um, one of the key aspects is storytelling, inspiring storytelling. And my partner, Frank was, uh, repeating yesterday something I hadn't heard for a while, which is uh, Stan, uh, the former, or, or the, the current head of um, insights at Unilever, who um, showed his board of directors a picture, a street scene uh, that was obviously somewhere in Southeast Asia uh, and asked them, where is this? You know, tell me about this. And, uh, and, and they started guessing Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. Um, and there were, there were a few Indian board members at the time. And he goes, no, this is Edgware Road. It's less than three miles from here. And we are not providing any products for this community, which by the way is now X million large and so. And he could have shown them the data, but he told them a story and he got them involved. And so how important do you think storytelling, you mentioned inspiring already, but I mean, where have you seen that be important? Oh my gosh. Uh, it, I mean, uh, you, we talked about Adobe. They tell their story very well. I mean, they went through a business model shift, as you referred to, from CDs to software. And, they, and Wall Street went right with them, right? And uh, Hugh Johnson, who's the CFO of Pepsi, PepsiCo, yes. uh, I was on a board with him. He, I brought him in to speak to some marketers about a year ago. Uh, at, and actually, it was the FE anniversary. Oh, yes. And... And Hugh talked about storytelling. This is the CFO talking about storytelling. And he said he always begins his quarterly earnings call with the story of the company and what they're trying to do. And then he gets to the results for that quarter. But he said, if all you talk about is your results for the quarter, analysts are going to focus on the results for the quarter. Yeah, yeah. If you start with telling the story of the journey your company is on, you know, where, where, where you are seeking competitive advantage, 
what you were trying to do with your brands, with your consumers, with your business model, your aspiration, your purpose as a company. Begin with that, tell your story, then shift to the results. And he said, he's had quarters where he's had terrible results, but the, but the stock price went up because the story is strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, of course, you have to deliver against the story, et cetera, et cetera. But begin with the story. I mean, we are storytellers. Stories motivate people. They teach people. They inspire people. And we sometimes overlook that. You know, yeah, people so make decisions with their whole brain. And we have to always be talking about the whole brain. You know, oh. the right side, the left side, the emotion, the ra rationality. You know, I, one, one reason P&G is the company it is now versus the company it was 20 years ago is it became more emotional. Yeah. It became more caring. It became more whole brain. And, um, and I think, uh, and it continues to evolve that as they go forward. Well, Jim, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going on right now around us and the role that marketers can play. Because um, there's a lot of hurt. Uh, and, and I'm zooming in, especially now on the second um, uh, struggle, if you like, dominating the news here in the US now, um, uh, that of uh, inequality, uh, racial inequality, economic inequality. We're seeing, I think yesterday, a big study came out from England that showed, uh, I think they did the biggest analysis of, of COVID uh, um, victims so far, and it's huge inequality uh, amplified all over. And, uh, and, it, and it begs the question, um, have we done enough? Can we do more? Because we are um, the people that are shaping the messages. I go all the way back to Dove Real Beauty, and they had all these programs in place to teach kids in high schools, or sorry, in primary schools, about how fake most of the advertising that they were seeing was. Um, and at the same time, uh, they realized that their ads were actually the biggest impact on the, the real world because billions of people were seeing those ads. And so great that you have charity projects and education projects, but they were reaching impressive numbers like five and seven million people. But the ads were reaching billions of people, literally. Um, and so they started to realize the role they had. And I have this struggle with my wife who says, look, uh, it's, it's unforgiving that you show ads in Asia of products with white people as, you know, godified, um, because apparently that's, you know, who you want people to think they are. And there's a bit of a chicken or egg here because you can't be the only brand doing this, which is why Paul Pullman, I think, with Imagine, tries to reach out to whole industries. But, you know, let's bring, and it's a difficult question, but let's bring this struggle around inequality home. Marketers listening today, what do you think they need to be doing? I think the role is more important than ever in companies, Mark. I was just talking to a CMO yesterday about how they feel their role has become more, more, more important for their company, for, the, for society at large over the last several months. The biggest thing CMOs need to be doing is, and this is, again, they should always be doing this, but be in touch first with your employees and, 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 and listen to them. Listen to your employees of all types. Listen to what they're going through. Listen to their ideas. Listen to how they're seeing the world. Listen to what they think we should be doing. The ideas are in every organization. So important. And tap into that. Spend time with it. You know, one gift from my podcast is I talk with these amazing leaders, one a week, even more sometimes. And one theme from the most amazing people in our industry is they spend a lot of time, sincere time, listening, learning, asking what they can do to help them be a better organization, help them be happier, help them be more fulfilled, help them be more effective. Help them, be, do, help them do the right thing because CMOs are on the, you know, they're on the cutting edge of some really tough calls. You know, yeah. do you boycott Facebook or not? Yeah. You know, uh, what, what's, your, what's your story with your agencies who have teams who do not represent the consumers we serve? How do you deal with that? 
How urgent is that for you? How accountable are you going to make them? So, so, but my first, you know, it's a long winded answer, but be in touch with your consumers. Yes. But with your employees, even more so. Yeah. Start close to home. The ideas are there. So that gets, I mean, that, 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 that touches on the point which um, in the Institute for Real Growth program has really been uh, fundamental. And, and with COVID happening uh, first, that really highlighted it. That if you break up the world in uh, four stakeholders, and there's no holy definition, but, you know, indeed the customers, your colleagues, the community around you, and then the capital markets. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of messy. Um, and prior to COVID, I would argue that in the boardroom, in any executive committee, the shareholder and the customer were pretty well represented. Because if you didn't, if you screwed up towards them, um, you weren't, it wasn't going to end well, as you say. Uh, post COVID, the week after, suddenly, uh, you seem to have a whole pass on results, at least for this year. Um, customer satisfaction, yes, but no, what we were really talking about in the boardroom was the colleague and the community. Mm -hmm. So a complete flip of which yeah. two stakeholders were most important. And the sentiment among the CMOs in the IRG program was we've been given much to your opening statement. We've been given a little bit of time to think through the big questions of when the crisis ends and we, and we enter into a new normal. How do we rebalance those stakeholders? And I, I'd love your perspective on the role of the marketer, because the marketer you know, isn't typically responsible for employee relationships mm -hmm. or perhaps corporate brands uh, you know, and, and pride and reputation. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So as you are a CMO and you're coming in and you're thinking about what role you play for the company as it navigates these new waters, what are your recommendations? How far do you step up without treading on people's toes and doing it uh, wisely? Well, I, I think the CMO can be the catalyst. I think what, we can't waste what's happening now. No. You know, we have, to, we have to make explicit what has just happened to our lives, our society, our organization, and decide how we're going to change because of that on a more sustained basis. So there are... And, you know, I don't hear anyone saying this, but there is no back to normal. This is, this is an experience none of us have gone through. I do think some of the social unrest that's happening is going to have a lasting impact. It feels more serious now yeah. uh, for a multitude of reasons. We can get into that if you want, but politics is part of it and leadership's part of it. But I think let's do not waste what is happening you know, codify this, use it as a chance to renew, refresh, recommit on your, on, on, on your purpose, on, 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 your, on your behaviors. So, and the CMO can bring that, can be the one who brings that group together. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, people, you, you hear it as well. People are saying, I'm more in touch with my employees. We're working faster. We're more agile. We're more caring. You know, we're more empathetic. We're, uh, we're less political. Uh, and you know, that's how we should be every day. So we need to take these lessons, this rebirth, if you will, and, and be the, be the leader, be the person within your company who is going to stay very, very close to what's just happened and, and make sure that we, we do not forget it, that we build it into the company, the new company we're trying to recreate together. And the CMO is well positioned to do that because they're, they're in many companies, the most external facing person. Yeah. Of course, sales is, but sales is external fa facing in a, in a bit more of a narrow way, an important way, but a narrow way. The CMO is external facing in an enormous way with all stakeholders. And, and so I think the CMO is well, well placed in the organization to lead a cultural change within companies. Of course, working with everyone, HR, everybody else, but but I think the CMO, it's, it's, a, it's a moment in time for us to really shine. So we're, we're literally, after this um, conversation, I'm putting the finishing touches to an article that we're writing for Fast Company. And it says uh, the time for, C, uh, for Da Vinci leaders to step up is now. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I, so I, I want to chime in on what you were saying. I believe that um, through our craft, um, there are 
capabilities that marketers bring that the rest of the organization need from them now. And yes, that may not be the traditional marketing area, but you're applying your ability to listen and to go from the words that people may use to describe how they feel to what the true underneath underlying insights are. And really important, you're good at helping as marketers to think through how you move from an insight to a proposition, to a value equation, something that we offer that now the discussion is value for whom? Well, let's think through what the value is for the employee, for our colleagues, for the communities that we sit within. Um, and okay, that might not be your functional area, but it's the capability you bring, as you say, to champion your team along to say, and that's probably the most important thing, never waste the power of a crisis. People are listening for the first time in many years mm -hmm. and really willing to fundamentally shift their strategy. So if you're sitting on the sideline and not applying the capabilities you need, what you bring naturally as a marketer to collaborate with your partners, it's a, it's a huge wasted opportunity. I would like to get real in the last five minutes and talk a little bit about the role of business because you skirted by it. Um, we talked about how the, the marketer can play a larger than usual role in helping the whole company rethink its strategy. Let's talk about the role that business can play, perhaps beyond the role that business has traditionally played in society, given that some other of the levers of traditional power in society are not, or actually negatively influencing that. Well, how do you see the role of business right now? Oh, well, business is our hope, Mark. It is our hope. This is where change will come from. It's not coming from governments right now. It's not really coming from universities in the way it could. Uh, and businesses are stepping up. And to me, this is our hope. And we have to fulfill that as leaders. If we want change in the world that will make this a place that is a good place to live, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, business is going to have to lead that. And, and we need to prepare, be preparing leaders, and part of what you're doing at IRG is that, preparing leaders to manage in a world where we do have to care about the planet, we have to care about society, we have to care, care about inequality, we have to care about racism. And if we don't do it, it won't be done. You know, a, a, a P&G sales leader said to me once when I was a young person, he just put me aside, he said, if it is to be, it's up to me. Sounds like a platitude. But he was making a lesson to me about accountability and leadership. And if it is to be, it's up to me. And I think that's our mantra. And so, and we, we, we absolutely need to step up. And I, I thank you for bringing leaders on on this uh, podcast or this or into IRG who are living that and who are demonstrating that. And we all need to be doing that. And, and thankfully many are, and I firmly believe they will be successful. They will be successful financially and they will be successful in attracting wonderful talent because they're trying to make this world a better place. That's our role. Well, Jim, it's, uh, it's, it, it's so, empowering but also inspiring to hear you say that if i look at the the people that have committed to be part of this conversation to be part of this journey starting with yourself and then thinking through leaders like paul Palm and also keith reed sylvia lagnado who, who's on next week antonio lucio these are all leaders that recognize that they've done a bit of it they don't none of them have ever said to me anything like well you know i have the answers they always start with all the caveats of I'm yeah. still trying to figure this out, but relative to the audience, they've done it a few times over as you have. And I think one of the key success factors, it's, it's, it's basic change management is to, to have a source somewhere that gives you the confidence that it can be done and that someone's gone before you. Uh, I always qu uh, quote the sort of when Harry met Sally, I'll have what they're having. Um, you know, just the confidence that Adobe went through this, that Procter & Gamble went through this, so, so can we. I need to figure out how, but we can. Now, Jim, we've had a Q&A running uh, as we were talking, and quite frankly, not a lot of questions there, just a lot of fans uh, of you personally, 
One of them says you look like you're 23 years old, which is, I think, a huge compliment. <laughs> I think well, it was meant well, to do Thankfully, I feel that way too, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's all a mindset, right? No, no, to your point, Mark, is I think there's, you know, the uh, can Lions happen, what, two weeks ago virtually, and yes. at the end of the week, there was the, uh, the ANA Can Lions Growth Council, CMO Growth Council, which is, you yes. know, some of the most important CMOs in the world. Yes. If you listen to their priorities, and what they're tacking, and it's people like Julia Golden at Lego and Mathilde yeah. Delhomme at LVMH and, and Mark, of course, at P&G. I mean, yeah. it's serious stuff. And the first pillar they're starting with is, is society. Yeah. So it's things like this where we're coming together as competitors and working together on making this world, this industry, a better place. So I, I do think change is afoot, positive change among all the sadness and chaos we're living in, we have to step up. And, uh, you know, as, as businesses and especially as marketers, we are, we are, we are well positioned to be amazing cha change agents. And we, we, cannot, we cannot, we have to work, we cannot blow that. We have to work to our potential to make that happen. Well, you know, Jim, I, I think uh, what's so special, and, and, and thank you for mentioning that, that growth council, uh, the a and 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 the Can Lions get uh, credit for, pulling that meeting together. I, 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 the, the, the Institute for Real Growth started there. So two years ago, we were in a room and I'm just reflecting on the, on the shift we've made together because the discussion two years ago was quite, I've, I've described it in other meetings as almost therapy. People were complaining about their lack of influence, about their uh, lack of credibility, and, and the fact that so many other positions were being created that were eroding the CMO role. And we've moved from a place where we were reflecting on seeing that all happen and happening to us to actually a role where we are again, not just equal with the rest of the Exco, but now we have an opportunity to lead. And, and that's, I think, what motivates most marketers in the world. Um, and as they think through how to lead, it's going to take a village. It's going to take groups like this, like the Growth Council, like the, the, the Marketing 50 and the CMO Club. It doesn't matter uh, as long as the principles at the bottom are making a positive difference and shaping the world as it comes forward are, are the right guiding principles. Jim, I think your experience, uh, if people want to know more about this, if they, if they feel inspired by you, are you okay with us connecting them with you to take the conversation further? Of course, Mark. Absolutely. As always. Uh, I appreciate that. And I, I also want to thank you for your friendship and your partnership in uh, what is over 15 years of collaboration now. Um, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure and I always learn from you. Thank you so much. Well, Mark, thanks to you and Frank for what you're doing. And it's been a great chat as always. I'm glad I get out of bed at five in the morning to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you for that as well. Everyone, uh, we're, we're, we're closing down this chat. Uh, next week, it is Sylvia Lagnado. Who, uh, who started Dove Real Beauty. And, and quite frankly, that's the 30-year campaign that it's received the awards, quite rightfully, for having set the pace. And, uh, and, and, and that is uh, something we can all learn from. And she just keeps doing it over and over, most recently as global CMO at McDonald's and now at Natura, where she is the sustained growth officer. Uh, that's the, the brand that is Brazilian and also owns Avon, a female empowerment brand and Aesop, and The Body Shop. I mean, check, check, check. Uh, this is a woman that personifies purpose and business. And uh, I look forward to welcoming you a week from now with Sylvia Lagnado. Jim I can't wait for it. I can't wait, Mark. She's wonderful. I'm going to tune so in. Thank you so much for being here. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.